account of reality. Um, so that philosophy is a tool of analysis, right? So we have the principle of verification. We have the uh, incorporation of tautologies um, and analytic a priori claims, but also universal generalizations as not being counterexamples to logical positivism. And then finally, a recognition that philosophy isn't a discipline that, that constructs stuff, right? We don't formulate theory per se. What philosophy does is we analyze theory that has been already described or formed, and we tell whether it's logically consistent, valid, incoherent, and so on, right? It's a tool of analysis. So those are the, the, three, the three points. The, the interesting thing is, however, that there still remains um, a lot to be said as to the interaction between positivism and other fields of study. And uh, that's what we're going to discuss next. So now, um, what's important to understand is sort of the relationship between uh, positivism, uh, logical positivism, and basically the three schools, the three disciplines that it most addresses, right? There's a very specific, and there was uh, arguably a very deliberate attempt in, in defending and explaining this principle of verifiability to, to make sure that um, audiences and people, those interested in understanding logical positivism, understood how we can account for the principle of verification beyond logical positivism in other fields. Um, and there are three fields, three fields of study most affected positivists. The first field of study, obviously, is science, right? The first field of study most affected by um, logical positivism is science. Um, what happens now is that scientists make claims, they make propositions about the world, right? And what the, what the logical positivists then say is that this claim about the world, so we'll call this claim, claim X, right? This claim about the world, X, is said to describe some aspect of reality, right? Now, what the positives say is the following, right? Because remember, this is a meta-descriptive account. Because what we're doing is we're describing the, the scientist's description of reality. Um, they say, is... X verifiable in practice or principle. Right? This is a pretty cool tool to have, right? This is a pretty cool tool to see if what you're saying has any meaning, right? So scientists describe reality, positivism say it says, and we'll call that description X. Science, uh, logical positivists that say, is X verifiable in practice or in principle, right? Can we verify um, this claim, not reality, can we verify this claim? And that's, and, and that's also very important. This is, this, and this, this, is, this is important to understand because here's where a lot of confusion happens. Logical positivists aren't going to say, is reality, is this object or is this thing verifiable in experience, right? They're not going to talk about the thing itself being verifiable in experience, because um, we recognize, I never gave you the term for it, um, that the thing itself, what Kant named the noumenal, the, the ding on sick, the thing itself, is non-existent, right? So we're not interested in the thing itself, right? We're not interested in the thing itself. Um, what we're interested in is the, the proposition which attempts to describe the, 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 the phenomenal experience, right? Because all of that exists is the phenomenal experience. Is that proposition, is that proposition X, whatever that claim is, whatever that um, treatise is, whatever that doctrine is, is that thing X itself verifiable 
in phenomenal experience, right? Can, can, is there something that appeals to the senses? Because all that exists actually um, is data and the interpretation of that data, right? It's all sense data. There's nothing um, extra sensory, right? There is no extra sensory perception, right? Um, so the point is, the contribution to science is that this is a good way for science to check um, the coherence of its own claims, right? Hey, I'm a scientist and I just made claim X. Um, now, I'm not referring to my claim X. I mean, I'm not referring to the object that I'm describing, but does my claim X, can that claim then be reduced to this object, right? Is there a, is there a consistent line of reasoning that leads um, an interested reader from my claim to the experience in reality, the phenomenal experience in reality? If there's a consistent line of reasoning that leads from my claim to the thing in reality, right? This is like actually like the scientific method, right? My hypothesis does it lead to the thing itself? Can not the thing itself, but the representation, the phenomenal experience of this thing? Um, then you can see that there's there's power in that, right? Uh, re reproducibility is one of them, right? So that a scientist can take an experiment that he or she has done in a lab um, uh, and reproduce it in other labs, right? Given given the same conditions. So it's not so much the the positivist isn't concerned with um, necessarily reality itself. Um, what it's concerned with is the relationship between this thing and reality. So it's, it's, it becomes a dynamic, a very dynamic process. That's the first. Okay. The second, the second is, uh, actually I would say that's the easiest part. The second I, I think is actually harder, right? Um, the relationship between logical positivism and science is more intuitive to understand than the relationship between logical positivism and ethics. If the claim that is the foundation of your, um, your discipline or your tool of analysis to be specific is that every proposition must be able in, in order to be meaningful in practice or in principle to be reducible to fact, aka therefore being verifiable, right? If that's the claim, then the question of ethics becomes a bit of a dilemma, right? Because aesthetics, ethics, um, these are more subjective, interpretive uh, concepts, right? The, the idea of happiness becomes problematic. How do I verify happiness in experience, right? How do I de verify satisfaction and experience? How do I verify um, hope and generosity and so on and so on and so on? How do I, ethics is, 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 is not necessarily antithetical to science, but it's a different domain of, of analysis. Science is interested in describing the world and it's descriptive, right? Ethics is completely different, right? Ethics isn't a descriptive account. Ethics is a prescriptive account. Okay, so how is it that um, this is incorporated into uh, logical positivism? Well, first off, um, it's important to understand, and I've done this in um, previous lectures, John Stuart Mills' account of utilitarianness, utilitarianism um, is indebted, in a sense, to logical positivism, right? That the, the attempt to describe happiness and satisfaction um, and the GHP, the Greatest Happiness Principle, is itself reducible to um, verifiable um, facts. And I've gone through that discussion, and I'm continuing to go through that discussion in my other videos on John Stuart Mill's account of utilitarianism. So there's a lot loaded in there, but you'll just have to take my word for it. 